State of the United States and this honorable court. The attorneys who will answer the calendar in this case of Wynn v. State of North Dakota are Allison Gopi and Sean Vanda for Matthew Wynn, and Andrew Chang and Grace Zhao for State of North Dakota. Please be seated. Good afternoon. We are ready to hear argument in the case of Wynn against North Dakota. Uh, and I believe we, st we start with Ms. Gokey. Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Allison Gokey, and I and my co-counsel, Mr. Sean Janda, represent the petitioner, Mr. Matthew Wynn, in today's proceedings. I will be addressing the state's violation of Mr. Wynn's Fourth Amendment property-based rights, while my co-counsel will be addressing the violation of his privacy rights. Your Honors, this case is about a basic concept in American property law. Every man's home is his castle, and he has a right to retreat within it and there be free from governmental intrusion. Two principles underlie that concept, privacy and security. But what property rights did he have in the common hallway your Honor, Mr. Wynn had at least two property rights that are of relevance here. First, he had a right to the use and enjoyment of the hallway, and second, he had the right to exclude the general public. But he has the right to the use and enjoyment of a public park, too, doesn't he? Yes, Your Honor, but in this particular case, the full use and enjoyment of the second floor hallway was necessary for Mr. Wynn in order to access his home. And if you turn to this court's decision in Oliver, where it cited approvingly to lower court cases in defining the curtilage, those courts said that curtilage is the space that is necessary for the use and enjoyment of the home. Mr. Wynn could not get to his front door, he could not pick up his packages, he could not welcome guests into the gateway to his home without passing through the so space. if there was a three mile driveway through fields, would that entire driveway be a curtilage? Well, Your Honor, you would also then want to look at both the security and privacy elements that are central to the home and also define the curtilage. But, and that you're, but you're using, um, I mean, your argument, as I understand, is he actually has a property right in, as it were, the easement up to his front door Yes, Your Honor. So aren't, I mean, as, as Justice Freeland said, aren't there limits to that? There are limits to that, which this court can look to the four-factor Dunn test that it outlined in Dunn as sort of defining the boundaries of the curtilage. So this court has said in the rural context, for instance, you may have ownership over an entire acre of land, but that does not necessarily mean that that entire acre is your curtilage. In the same way, Mr. Wynn has a full right of use and enjoyment in this space, and looking to the, the particular security and privacy interests that define the curtilage, that's going to give you the boundaries that you're looking for. Are there any cases that hold that the common areas of an apartment building are considered curtilage, whether the common law or um, other, other sources? Uh, I believe that one of the lower courts has cited the, uh, in the particular context of a drug sniffing dog that there was curtilage in a common hallway. But this court has also found in McDonald that there is a constitutionally protected interest in the integrity and security of the entire building. And if you look to the facts of McDonald, that was a boarding house case. And there, this court found that someone who was renting a room from a landlady within the boarding house was entitled to Fourth Amendment protection, even in the common spaces of that boarding house. But that's what I wonder. I mean, actually, I find this notion of curtilage very unhelpful. And it may be that the time has come for this court to abandon such a silly old common law word and get to the essence of what we're worried about here. You've suggested one thing. We're worried about protecting the space that a person needs to use to get up to, shall I say, the enclosed areas of the place where he lives, his apartment, his house, what have you. Uh, but, but what is it that we are actually trying to define? Your Honor, you're trying to define those areas that have the same security and privacy principles as the home. So when Mr. Wynn walks into his home, he has a protection, both security and privacy based, and that protection extends into the second floor hallway outside of his home. Well, think of Hardeen's. Would, would a front porch, uh, what privacy interests do you have in your front porch? It seems to me there are all sorts of things you would not do on the front porch because you're in full view of the neighborhood. Your Honor, you may embrace a friend from a long absence on your front porch. You may share a goodnight kiss on your front porch. You may hug your children goodbye when you're leaving for work for the day on your front porch. And that's exactly what happens in this second floor hallway as well. That's exactly what happens in a front door to an apartment complex. But isn't there a, lo a lower expectation of privacy because um, 
the front porch is open to public view in you know kind of our ordinary sense in a you know a typical suburban or urban environment um why why shouldn't the court um consider a lowered expectation of privacy even though there's a property right at stake there's a, a trespass interest here but um you're not you're you're exposed to the public in a way differently than you would be inside a home well, Your Honor, you could also argue that this space is actually more shielded off than a front porch to a single family home would be. So this space exists behind a locked, secured front door that is only accessible if you have a key or if you're invited in by a tenant. And that is justified by both the door itself, by the tenant's manual, which says that they are only allowed to invite licensed guests into the building, and by burglary law and trespass law, all of which would recognize these spaces as being protected as a part of the dwelling home of the apartment. Why shouldn't we view these officers as invited in by Ms. Lockwood? Well, Your Honor, these officers were not invited in on the day when they actually entered and conducted this drug sniff. Uh, they snuck past a woman, never identified themselves, did not ask for permission. And so therefore, as the North, North Dakota Supreme Court recognized and the trial court recognized, committed a technical trespass. And that trespass is what constitutes the Fourth Amendment violation. But wasn't it in, in Oliver or Dunn, one of the cases um, explicitly said that um, Fourth Amendment privacy is not coexistence with um, uh, the, uh, the the law of trespass. What, what do we do about our, our prior precedent that hold that? So the precedent would say that you would need to actually be within the curtilage in order for a trespass to constitute a Fourth Amendment violation. And in this case, when the police officers entered Mr. Wynn's second floor hallway, because that space is so central to his home, it's associated with the intimate activities of his home, associated with the privacy of his home, and is also secured by a private locked door in an apartment complex, all of those interests justify that being the curtilage. Well, so that when might support your, your co-counsel's argument, but I'm still stuck on the question whether there's actually a property interest that Mr. Wynn had in the vestibule, in the stairwells, in the laundry room, and in the hallway. It seems to me just as plausible to think that he has a license from the landlord to use those areas, but it's really the landlord who maintains them. It's it's the building owner who's responsible for um, security issues uh, in those areas. It, it's, there's a real line that gets drawn when he unlocks the door to that apartment and walks in. Yes, Your Honor, but the, so as this court said in, um, in Chapman versus United States and actually also in uh, Justice Scalia's concurrence in Minnesota versus Carter, when we're looking to the underlying property interests, we're not necessarily concerned with who is the deed holder. We're concerned with who's using the space. What is the functional purpose of that space? So in Minnesota versus Olson, this court said that an overnight guest in a house had the same Fourth Amendment protection in that house as the actual deed holder of the home themselves. But you're using that, that's a durational concept, the, the overnight guest or the person who's staying for a few weeks uh, versus the interest in the actual space. Would you draw a distinction, by the way, I suppose you probably wouldn't, between uh, the hallways in an apartment building like this one and the hallways in a condominium? No, Your Honor. So because that space, I mean, you, the curtilage is a fact-based inquiry, so you would want to look at the specific details of that condominium. But assuming that it is also behind a locked entrance and it is the space where Mr. Wynn's private activities can spill out into the hallway or do occur within the hallway, then that justifies that as curtilage. And the fact that Mr. Wynn and his fellow tenants leave their personal effects in this hallway, they conduct their laundry in this hallway, they carry their dirty clothes down the hallway and leave it in the laundromat, that indicates that they have some expectation that that is both private and secure. What if there had been a doorman in this apartment building and the doorman had let the police in knowing that they were police? Would you still have an argument? Yes, Your Honor. So there were two violations in this particular case. First, when the police trespassed on the apartment complex and onto Mr. Wynn's second floor hallway. Second, when they conducted a drug sniff with a trained drug detection dog outside his front door. And so in the first case, if the police had actually been invited into the building, then the same trespass would not be at issue and they had a license to proceed. But in the second case, as this court recognized in Hardeen's, there is no implicit or explicit license to bring a drug sniffing dog four inches in front of your front door. And so the, the police bringing that dog into Mr. Wynn's space would then constitute a violation of his Fourth Amendment property-based protection. Um, setting aside the <clears throat> bringing the dog into the space, um, Hardeen's does stand for the proposition that there's not a cate categorical right um, to exclude um, people from the curtilage. Um, why wasn't there an implied license um, that had not been revoked by Mr. Wynn or any of the other 
um, renters for um, pe members of the public to enter this building and that uh, the police um, ha had a, a, a right to be there that had not been revoked by your client. Well, Your Honor, there is actually an explicit prohibition against sort of members of the general public walking in and out of these spaces. That's what the front door at the security, securitized door marks, and that's what the manual says. But do we have to disregard the facts? The facts show that tenants constantly, you know, left the door open just as the police um, enjoyed here to let the person behind them come in. Well, then, in this case, you want to look to uh, Hardeen's, the decision in Hardeen's, where this court said that <coughs> what we should look to is the reasonably respectful citizen. So the fact that someone can trespass on your front porch, that a child can wander through your driveway, as, as um, uh, Justice Kaczynski said in one of his descriptions of the curtilage, that should not define the boundaries of the police's Fourth Amendment invasion. So we need to see what the reasonable, respectful citizen uh, following the laws of social expectations and property law and the trespass law of the building, that's what marks the boundaries of the curtilage. What if Miss Lockwood had called them on this day? So it happens that she called them a different day, but why does that matter? Can you, what would your response be if she had called on this day and said, I smell marijuana in the hallway? Would, would the police have been entitled to do what they did then? Yes, Your Honor, because then she would have invited them into the building, and as the police in this case did, they smelled the marijuana themselves. They had probable cause and exigency to investigate. The marijuana was being smelled. This was the November search. The marijuana was smelled by the police at the time, and they had to conduct a search in the event that that evidence would disappear. But here, a month later, there was no indication that that same exigency existed. They had no similar understanding of probable cause, and Mr. Wynn actually was not even in the apartment for the first time the search was around. He had moved in after the first search was conducted in November. But they, they didn't know that, right? So they know that uh, someone in the apartment is worried about people having drugs in the apartment, and she asked the police to investigate. I, I'm not sure why the difference in time between when she made the request and now makes a difference. Well, so, Your Honor, in that case, then you see that Mr. Wynn was not there for the first search, and he was present in the second search. So if you have sort of an open-ended license for the police to come and search at any point, then you are exposing a variety of people who may not have been implicated in the first initial call to the search by the police and to the subsequent invasion of their home. So in order for the police... Doesn't the fact that Ms. Lockwood called remind us that the other people in the apartment building have an interest in the safety of the building and what's happening in the building and whether there's drug dealing happening that might be dangerous in the building. Why doesn't that change our inquiry here from a private home? Well, Your Honor, the, the police would still have the ability to, uh, once they have received permission, to enter the building, to knock and talk, to conduct their normal investigation as police officers passing through would. And, but the, and you see, that's the critical thing, because although, on the one hand, um, maybe this isn't totally open to the general public, on the other hand, there are so many other people who have the authority to invite others into that uh, hallway and into the other common areas. It's 28 units or something like that in the uh, building. Yes, sir. Um, that suggests that Mr. Wynn does not have the right to exclude. He's at the mercy of whoever, whether it's Ms. Lockwood or whether it's anybody else. Your Honor, he does have the right to exclude the general public. And as this court recognizes- but does, but How does he know who's in the general public if these random people are coming in that each of the 28 other or 27 other apartment dwellers have invited well the tenants manual says that they are only supposed to invite guests in who have been given permission and tenants are supposed to police the security of this door so if mr Wynn sees someone loitering in the hallway he's perfectly free to ask them what they're doing there and if they have a right to be there and as this court has recognized in its matlock cases through georgia versus randolph there is a presumption that there is a Fourth Amendment right in shared spaces. Now, is it possible for us to rule in your favor without just holding categorically that all common areas within apartment buildings are within the, proper, the, the legitimate property rights of the apartment dwellers? Well, Your Honor, in order to actually protect Mr. Wynn's Fourth Amendment protection in his home, you have to at least give a buffer zone outside of that. Otherwise... I'm asking how big is the buffer zone? Is it just the area right in front of his apartment, number 214? Is it the third floor and the first floor, too? Is it the laundry room? It sounds to me like you have an all-or-nothing proposition. It's either all curtilage, if you will, or protected property interests, or not. 
No, Your Honor. So in this case, Mr. Wynn's curtilage would just be the second floor hallway. That space is private and secure. It's closed off from the outside observation of passersby, and it's being used for those intimate uses that we associate with the home. Now, if that is sort of more so intimate uses, he's, he's using it for other than walking up to it. But well, it's instructive to define intimate uses with uh, the Dunn factors, sort of providing our counterpoint. So if you look to what this court said and done, it was immediately obvious to the police walking up to the barn that some truck that was delivering phenylacetic acid, the scent of chemicals emanating from that barn, the sound of electric motor pumps, that was obviously to the police not a domestic space. And therefore, there was no question that that was not curtilage. Here, the moment the police officers walk past the locked, secured private door of an apartment complex, walk up those stairs, see the second floor hallway, which has slippers, mats, welcome mats, people's laundry at the end of the hallway, private effects left in the hallway. This is a residential space. No one is using this for delivering phenylacetic acid as in done. And the police should be on notice. We're going to have to craft a rule in this case that will apply to tens of thousands of apartment buildings and condominiums. And um, it seems to me like we're, we're getting bogged down into the facts. Is there a lock? Is there not a lock? Is there a tenant's manual? Do people sneak in? Do they not? Um, how can we possibly um, employ a rule that's going to apply to thousands of investigations or encounters? Um, why isn't the common law rule more or less as we're going to treat a multi-family unit differently than a single family dwelling? Kind of a bright line. Um, it's easy to apply. It's easy to understand. Um, tenants like Mr. Wynn would know that the common areas are op open to the public, including the police. Why not a bright line test here? Well, Your Honor, I see that my time is up. May I please respond? Yes. Please. Thank you. Because your Fourth Amendment rights should not rise and fall based upon your ability to afford a house or an apartment. Mr. Wynn, at his front door, has the exact same expectation of privacy and security in that space as someone would in a single-family home. And Mr. Wynn deserves the same protection under the Fourth Amendment. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. You may proceed. Mr. Thank you, Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Sean Janda, and I represent petitioner Matthew Wynn. As Ms. Gokey indicated, I will be covering the officer's violation of Mr. Wynn's privacy-based rights under the Fourth Amendment. Before I begin, may I reserve five minutes of my time for rebuttal? You may. Thank you. Whenever government officials, in the course of searching for information, intrude upon an expectation of privacy that is both subjectively held and objectively reasonable, they have conducted a search under the Fourth Amendment. The officers here did so two separate times. First, when they entered the locked, secured common areas of Mr. Wynn's apartment building, and again when they used a drug-sniffing dog mere inches outside Mr. Wynn's front door to obtain information about the interior of his home. Well, can we talk about that for a minute? Uh, why does he have a legitimate expectation of privacy in the, the vapors from an illegal drug that the dog detects, given Illinois against Kabbalah and related cases? Because this court said in Kylo, Your Honor, that when it comes to the home, all details are intimate details. And so in the place in Caballes line of cases. But in Kylo, you could perhaps have um, figured out who was hot or what they were doing, whether someone was taking a bath. Um, here, we just have a yes or no. We don't know anything about what it is that's triggering the dog other than that we think that means there's something illegal happening. But there are two considerations, Your Honor, that counsel that this case is more like Kylo, one based in this court's precedent and one based in the evolving science since the Caballos decision. So to begin with this court's precedent, this court's always looked first at where a search is occurring, and the court's always held that the home has pride of place in the Fourth Amendment. And so in this case, where the officers are searching the home rather than searching a car like in Caballos or airport luggage like in place, is categorically qualitatively different from those cases. But the logic of Caballos was, was related to the legitimacy of one's expectation of privacy. It wasn't so much that this happened to be a car or it happened to be, you know, a home or something. The court said um, maybe if different information were being sought, uh, maybe you would have needed a warrant. You do sometimes need a warrant to search the interior of cars, etc. But it said you don't even have a legitimate expectation to withhold from law enforcement uh, your use of illegal drugs. So it's true, Your Honor, that there's very absolute language, both in Caballes and in Kylo. Kylo says all details are intimate in the home, 
and Cabayas says there's no expectation of privacy and contraband. And why was this even in the home anyway? Apparently these fumes were wafting out from under the door. It's true, Your Honor. The dog doesn't go inside. But that argument's foreclosed by this court's decision in Kylo. So there the officers were standing on a public sidewalk and measuring heat radiating off of the home. And this court found that that made no difference because they were using their thermal imaging device to obtain information about the interior of the home. So whether it's heat waves radiating off the home or molecules uh, going under the front door and then being detected in the hallway, the key part of the search is the fact that the officers are obtaining information about what's inside the home. But in Kylo, as I was asking before, you could have figured out when someone is taking their bath. That is not illegal activity. Here, all you learn is the act illegal activity. So why isn't it controlled by the other cases about dog sniffs and drugs? Because or, Your Honor, or detection of drugs. Those were the facts of Kylo, but the Kylo holding was broader than that. And so the court did make a decision that that would be one potential invasion of privacy in that context, but it also said that regardless of what's happening, all details are intimate in the home. And the court there cited to the Caro and Knotts cases, where this court um, in the one held that you can put a beeper in a can and follow that as long as it's on public roads. But then the other says, as soon as that can's brought into a home, it becomes a violation of the Fourth Amendment. And so there, uh, the kind of bright line drawn at the front of the home isn't about revealing any additional information. When you cross the line with your can um, of ether, the beeper's not providing any information about the interior of the home. But the bright line's been crossed. But and there is so much flowery rhetoric in Kylo about the lady taking her bath <laughs> and other sorts of things that are perfectly legal uh, to do. I think the court was, in fact, I mean, this court was quite concerned about the over-inclusiveness of the information. And we don't want the police going around collecting information about our daily habits if we're not doing anything illegal. Whereas here, uh, whether or not this is a reliable dog is not a question before us, but the dog is going to alert to the things it's been trained to alert to and that is the, the fumes from illegal substances. So as a preliminary matter, Your Honor, um, there is certainly a lot of flowery rhetoric in, rhetoric in Kylo, but the legal analysis there is clear. When it comes to the home, everything is intimate under the Fourth Amendment. But even- but Kylo, so this gets to now our issue about apartments, right? Kylo is just a single family home. Here, there isn't the expectation of privacy about what's happening, wafting from the door, because everyone walking up and down that hallway smells what's coming from the door. If you're cooking spicy food, everyone in this building knows it. Right, and that would probably be true, Your Honor, if uh, this was actually able to be smelled by humans. But what the court said in Kylo was that when we're dealing with devices not in common public use, even if the officers are standing in a public place, a place they have a right to be, and detecting evidence of the activity, uh, that's still problematic because you have a reasonable expectation of privacy against things that aren't being commonly used. So there it's a thermal imaging device. Uh, here it's a drug detection dog, which the record tells us isn't used by any private company in Fargo. So Mr. Wynn has a reasonable expectation that someone's not going to be running a drug detection dog outside of his front door. But even beyond that, Your Honor, in um, the Why 10 years- Why is that years, a reasonable expectation? I mean, the dog, this was a big dog. I realize the apartment had a no big dogs rule. Uh, but it uh, doesn't seem to be that important uh, a distinction. Uh, your, I mean, your theory seems to depend on the idea that dogs walking up and down a hall are somehow intruding on the privacy of the actual home, and I'm not sure that that is, is an accurate description of where people actually lock the rest of the world out. Well, so drug detection dogs, Your Honor. And the drug detection dog at issue here is as far from your friendly household pet as the thermal imaging device in Kylo is from a thermometer. They're sort of the same, but they uh, encapsulate entirely different things. The dog here is highly trained, it's highly bred, and it can detect and alert to odors that your typical house pet can't alert to. But and that, that, But that was true in place also when the dog could alert to drugs in, in a piece of luggage. That's true, Your Honor, but in the place in Caballes context, the extraordinarily diminished expectation of privacy one has in a car or an airport luggage might mean that a search, a dog sniff, is not so intrusive as to raise Fourth Amendment concerns. Well, um, the Fourth Amendment applies to not only houses, but effects, and in Jones, a car was deemed to have a property right. You know, luggage is an effect that, um, you know, the, the law enforcement can't open that suitcase without probable cause or warrant. What's, what's the difference? So the First Amendment certainly protects effects, it protects cars, it protects luggage, but the courts never held that there's the same high level of protection in those things as there is in the home. The home seems to be of central concern to the founders. Um, they included it in two of the original 10 amendments in the Bill of Rights, and it's 
pretty clear that the home receives the most protection of anything um, relative to a car or airport luggage. But then even beyond the pride of place the home's traditionally received from this court, the science that's developed since Caballes indicates that dog sniffs aren't truly binary. Instead, when dogs alert, what they're actually alerting to are chemicals associated with compounds that are illegal. Um, but those chemicals are also present in a wide variety of illicit substances as well. Um, well, isn't it enough, though, to make sure, as the Supreme Court has said, um, that the dog is able to discern uh, the difference between the illegal substances and other substances. That's why we have training for these dogs. The dog in this case, Earl, uh, was very well trained, uh, the record tells us. So dogs are actually trained to alert to the compounds themselves. And there doesn't seem to be a distinction between the compounds as they're used in the drugs and the compounds as they're used in illicit substances. And so we're not arguing that the alert wouldn't provide probable cause, um, given the experience we have with dogs in this court's it Harris. It seems like you are, though. That was exactly what I was just going to ask you. I mean, it, the fact that the dog can alert to the wrong thing seems to be an argument you could use to say you shouldn't have been able to get the warrant based on the dog sniff. but but. If we think it's good enough to get the warrant, then I, I just don't see how, it's, how it affects the privacy interest, because all we know is it's saying yes or no. And if it's saying yes, we think it's drugs. Now, maybe you can say we don't have enough accuracy to get a warrant. OK, that's a different argument. But why does it go to privacy? The dog isn't telling us what's in the house. So it's true, Your Honor, that the dog isn't turning to the handler and saying, I smell marijuana, or I smell perfume, or I smell soap. But the dog is providing information about substances that are in the home. And so under the state's rule, where uh, police officers could use dogs in every context on any day um, just because they felt like it, you could obtain an extraordinary amount of information about what's happening inside of a home that goes to uh, intimate details that are illicit, not just intimate details that are illicit. But I don't think that's what the training of the dogs reflects. I think. Um it is a question of the sufficiency of the affidavit supporting the warrant. Is the dog sniff enough to suggest that uh, probable cause exists, that there's illegal substances in the place? Um, but when the dogs are trained, they're trained to find in a, in a room, let's say, uh, the places where there's something illegal. So it's true, Your Honor, that the dogs are trained that way and uh, are often right. And we're not going to claim that Earl isn't a good boy and doesn't smell it most Earl, of the time. Corporal Earl, whatever he was, you know, canine <laughs> officer Earl <laughs> was apparently quite good at his job. That's true, Your Honor. But any dog is alerting to these compounds. They're in a variety of things. I see my time's expired. May I briefly conclude? Please finish, yes. Thank you. And that, combined with the fact this home always receives the most protection under the Fourth Amendment, means that this search is too intrusive uh, for the Fourth Amendment to countenance it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chang? Good afternoon, Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Andrew Chang, and along with my co-counsel, Grace Zhao, I represent the respondent, the state of North Dakota. I will demonstrate that Officer Vinson and K-9 Earl's entry into the hallway and presence in front of Mr. Wynn's door did not violate his Fourth Amendment rights. My co-counsel will then go on to explain that given their lawful presence within this shared space, their additional execution of a K-9 sniff did not constitute a search within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment. So here's In my big problem with your first proposition. I don't know what else these people could have done to make it clear that the interior common spaces were not open to the general public, but in fact were reserved kind of pro rata for each tenant to use. They have an outside lock, they have an inside lock, they have signs. It's impossible to place an officer there 24 hours a day to make sure that tenants aren't disregarding this. It seems to me a very clear message that this is restricted space and that the residents of the building uh, have, have a right to exclude others, including these police officers who nobody that day invited in. Chief Justice Wood, the answer to that question is actually mirrored in your conversation with counsel for petitioner, because the problem is not whether or not Mr. Wynn can exclude members of the general public. Mr. Wynn has a problem because he can't exclude members that are co-tenants of his building and the guests that they invite. But From there's Mr. no evidence that any person in this building invited the two police officers in on that day. I thought we agreed in our earlier discussion that had they come immediately after Ms. Lockwood's call, perhaps she could be said to have invited them in. But on the day in question, 
no one invited them in. So that's the fact you have to live with. Your Honor, that's true, but the fact that Mr. Wynn doesn't have that power of excludability means that he can neither claim that that area is his curtilage, nor he, can he claim a reasonable expectation of privacy in that space. And I can address each is, of these in turn if you like. Is the Lockwood call just irrelevant in your view? I mean, if no one had ever called, could the officers have done what they did with this dog, come into the building, walk down the hall, sniffed everyone's door, just because it's an apartment building and no one has an expectation of privacy and no one has a property interest in the hallway? Yes, Your Honor, but we would say that the Michelle Lockwood call does have some relevance because, as my co-counsel will argue— Excuse me, can I just clarify what that answer of yours was? So in your view, um, in, say, the city of San Francisco, the police can go with a drug-sniffing dog to every apartment building in the city and march the dog up and down the hallways waiting to see where it alerts and then just go out and get warrants? Yes, Your Honor, and certainly that wouldn't That's be a, a judicious— very broad— Why isn't that a general warrant? practically um, in core violation of the Fourth Amendment. Your Honor, the reason why that's not a general warrant is because the general warrant would be allowing a police officer to go into the confines of a person's home. But in a world where Mr. Wynn cannot claim that the apartment building common hallways are his home, or nor can he claim that the areas are even his curtilage, then that general warrant doesn't exist because the police officers are not invading the home. But additionally, Your Honor, why Justice- Why isn't it his home, though, if it's you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of one and a little bit of the other. It's not a home like a single family isolated house with a front, front porch as we had in Hardin's. Uh, but it is the only way you can build most apartment buildings, unless you're talking about some garden apartment where you go up to the second floor on the outside. But um, most apartment buildings have interior hallways, and it's really an extraordinary claim to think that uh, everybody in the world can just get into the hallway however they can. Chief Justice Wood, the problem with that, though, is still that in United States versus Dunn, this court recognized that curtilage has to be that area so intimately tied to the home that it should be placed under the home's umbrella for Fourth Amendment protection. And this court has recognized... Now, would you define curtilage for me, since, as I said, I don't like that word? <laughs> yes, Your Honor. So curtilage should be defined by reference to whether or not a person has a unilateral right of excludability within that specific area. And this court's precedent in United States versus Oliver suggests that this is how we should interpret curtilage doctrine when we apply it to a new instance, which is whether or not a shared space in an apartment hallway could constitute an area of Fourth Amendment property-based protection. So what about the space that your doormat is on? Can you exclude people from that? No, Your Honor. In the same way that Mr. Wynn cannot exclude people from being in that area right in front of his doormat, in the same way that he cannot exclude people from that area right outside of his hallway, Mr. Wynn cannot claim curtilage because all of the members of his apartment building are able to not only be there, but also invite their guests to be there. But the and North Dakota Supreme Court said that the police trespassed. Isn't that a d definition or r ruling on state law that we can't depart from? Uh, no, Your Honor. This court has recognized in United States versus Oliver that the common law of trespass forbids intrusions upon land that the Constitution would not prescribe. So indicating that in the context of private residential property, uh, the state is very narrowly circumscribed Fourth Amendment protection to apply only to when the state invades a person's curtilage. And it's our submission that Mr. Wynn cannot so claim— So you're not disputing that it's a trespass because— So you're, you're agreeing you can't dispute that it's a trespass, but you're saying that's not the relevant question? Yes, Your Honor. So the Supreme Court of North Dakota did hold that Officer Vincent and K-9 Earl committed a physical trespass. But our only submission is that physical trespass is insufficient to give Fourth Amendment protection to that area. But doesn't a trespass mean they were infringing on someone's property rights? Whose property rights were they? So, Your Honor, they were probably infringing on the landlord's property rights. But even then, the landlord would probably— That's not what the North Dakota court said, though, necessarily. Doesn't Jones run in the opposite direction, that trespasses, that this court has been taking the idea of trespass more seriously of late? So, Your Honor, the differentiation between the current case and that of Jones is that in United States versus Jones, it was a case about trespass to chattel. And so if the police officer were to, for example, attach something to somebody's item, that would be a physical trespass that is a per se violation of the Fourth Amendment. But in the context of private residential property, for the last century, this court's jurisprudence has reflected the idea that there are areas called open fields where the government's ability to be there outweighs the person's privacy interest there. And there's area- Hallways are open fields in your view? Yes, Your Honor. The hallways are analogous to open fields. And while they don't intuitively seem like they have blades of grass growing out of them, they're open fields in the sense that they aren't his home, nor are they his curtilage. They're areas where he cannot exclude members of the public because from his perspective, those co-tenants and the people that they invite are members of the public. I, I have two related questions on, uh, following up on that. Um, so a, a landlord can never 
um, create a, uh, a secure environment that, w that we would deem to be curtilage. Justice Timkovich, we actually don't think that it's inevitable that there can never be curtilage in apartment buildings. For example, if landlord-tenant associations and municipal governments were to find our finding today problematic, then they could be able to create something in the landlord-tenant manual saying that the space right in front of your door is an area where you have well, unilateral excludability. Well, let's, let's say um, I, I created a, um, you know, a personal compound where family and friends, we, we live, it's a gated community. Um, wouldn't the common areas inside that gated community be, um, tr you know, basically traditional curtilage? No, Your Honor. There would still be an issue because all of the separate living units within that gated community. So there's, so there's nothing I can do if I share property with somebody else to, um, to protect the common areas from, from snoops. There's nothing that you can do individually, but if the Landlord-Tenant Association were to create a rule whereby you could have that unilateral excludability over specific areas, be it a doormat or perhaps a room, then you would be able to claim that that area is your curtilage and therefore should be protected under the Fourth Amendment. So the cur curtilage is going to depend on the Landlord-Tenant Handbook? Yes, Your Honor. Curtilage depends on whether or not there is a right of excludability, and the Landlord-Tenant Handbook is probably one of the only ways that we would be able to get there in the context of a multi- I don't understand why you think it can only be done in a collective way, or, or that actually, uh, to put it a little differently, why the curtilage has to be individual. So if two people own the house in Hardinas, um, it's no good because neither one of them can exclude pe other people from the front porch or if five people own the house, then it's nothing. It has to be only one person. No, Your Honor. So this court has never recognized this idea that if two people share a house, for example, two spouses, they have to exclude each other in order to say that that house is their home or that they have Fourth Amendment protection there. However, our only... So why isn't it the same even though it's a combination of of uh, different sorts of property rights when a landlord owns one building and leases out 28 apartments in the building and the 28 lessees have a leasehold interest and then it says there are common spaces uh, which are protected by lock and key why isn't that exactly the same thing? And there's a tenant's manual here, which you seem to think makes a difference. So Justice Wood, we have two responses to that, one more doctrinal, another one more intuitive. The doctrinal answer to that is reflected in Georgia versus Randolph, as counsel for petitioners bring up themselves. Georgia versus Randolph indicates that when people live in a standalone home together, if somebody invites the police into there, they have the unilateral ability, if they are present, to say that they don't want the police to enter. The problem with Mr. Wynn in this instance is that if any other member of his apartment complex were to invite the police there, counsel for petitioner themselves say that the police would have the unbridled right to be there so long as they have the invitation. Exactly. And if that were this case, maybe we wouldn't be here. But nobody else invited the police in this case. That's true, Your Honor. But Mr. Wynn's expectations, at least of whether or not that area of his home, are evaluated ex ante. The fact that people have the ability to invite the police to be there is a reason as to why he cannot claim that that area is his curtilage. The entire foundation of curtilage doctrine is to ask whether or not that area could be treated as an appurtenant of his home. And in a world where Mr. Wynn is put in a situation where people can invite the police to be in his home without his permission, then Mr. Wynn would no longer be able to claim at least property-based protection of that specific area. Okay, so let me ask you my condo hypothetical. Suppose this building were a condominium and each person owned the unit, of the, one of those 28 units, and everybody pays you know, $500 a month for upkeep of the common areas and for common expenditures. At that point, uh, would you consider those to be part of that person's property interest? No, Your Honor. Again, we run into the problem Even of excludability. They pay. Yes, Your Honor. Your deed says you have an undivided 128th interest in the common areas. Yes, Your Honor. They might have a financial interest and they might be able to have ownership they of that a area. Financial interest. But, Your Honor, the functional interest is cabined by the fact that they still don't have that power of excludability. If there is still an area within that condominium where other members of that condominium could invite the police to be there without their consent, then ex ante, that person can no longer claim that that area is an appurtenant of his home. And in fact, this court has 
kind of tackled this issue, albeit tangentially, in United States versus Johnson, which was a case about a hotel. In United States versus Johnson, even though there was a Fourth Amendment problem, this court held that the Fourth Amendment problem only began where the police went into the person's living quarters, which is to say his hotel room. And so even though people who live in a hotel do share some kind of quasi-contractual relationships with the other people that they live with, the fact is that the reason why this court held so is because Fourth Amendment protection, at least property-based, only attaches to the home or pertinent to the home, and the hallway doesn't function as a home or an analog. What is the... Sorry, go ahead. We also said in Hardeen's, though, that, um, that, that we, we look to sort of social custom and to um, the common law, to, to tradition and expectation. And um, why, why wouldn't, um, you know, that thought be evolutionary? The, you know, the Fourth Amendment's not static. It applies to iPhones and telephone booths and, and the like. Um, here, why isn't, you know, given that more people live in apartments closer together, um, why shouldn't um, our court recognized reality and extend at least some privacy curtilage-based rights to common areas where, like here, some effort's been taken to protect the um, privacy interests of the tenants. So, Your Honor, we certainly believe that the Fourth Amendment should be at least interpretable to accommodate modern circumstances. But the problem with respect to his property and his privacy-based claim is that the entire foundation of the Fourth Amendment is to protect two things. It's to protect people's ability to conceal private facts, and it's to protect their ability to seclude themselves within specific areas. And so if we take the Fourth Amendment and wrench it away from these roots, it no longer means anything. And in a world where Mr. Wynn cannot conceal private facts within the hallways of his apartment building, and in a world where he cannot seclude himself within that area because all of his co-tenants and their guests, members of the public, are able to be there, there, then the Fourth Amendment cannot evolve in a way that is so spurious as to go too far away from its Well, it just, it just means the police have to knock and get invited into the common areas. Well, that seems like a fairly simple rule, even um, in, from San Francisco to New York. The police will understand it's an objective rule. What's wrong with that? Your Honor, we do agree that there are ways that the police officers could have done this in a way that we would consider better practices, but the fact that they could have done it better doesn't make it a constitutional violation. The fact that Mr. Wynn cannot call that area his curtilage, and the fact that he doesn't have a reasonable expectation of privacy within that space pursuant to this court's decision in Rockus versus Illinois, which also highlighted the importance of unilateral dominion and control, indicates that Mr. Wynn simply did not have that Fourth Amendment protection attached to that area he's trying to claim Fourth Amendment protection for. Could they have created the expectation of privacy by agreeing among the tenants not to let police into the building? No, Your Honor, because if the if the tenants actually did invite the police into the building and violated that agreement, Mr. Wynn would not have any form of recourse. If the police actually went in pursuant to somebody's invitation, Mr. Wynn could say, hey, I thought you weren't going to do that, but the tenant would still have the unbridled right to do so. And violating a social expectation based on an oral promise does not a Fourth Amendment violation make, Your what Honor. What if they put it in the manual? We all agree to live here and not to let the police in. Well, Your Honor, this court in United States versus... Without a Oliver, warrant. <laughs> they do that in my neck of the woods, too. <laughs> the court in Oliver recognized that when we consider whether or not Fourth Amendment protection attaches, we look not only to the actual letter of the rule, like a landlord-tenant manual or a fence that says no trespassing. We also look to the social realities that actually exist. So if in a situation where there was an apartment building and people were able to show somehow that their apartment building had a relationship with each other so close that it resembled a standalone single family house, then maybe they would be, able, sorry, I see that my time has elapsed, could I briefly conclude? Sure. Then maybe they would be able to bring an ex post motion to suppress. But our only submission is that if it looks like an apartment and walks like an apartment, it probably is an apartment building. And in that sense, Mr. Wynn had neither a property or a privacy based protection in that area. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chang. Ms. Zhu. Good evening, Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Grace Sow for the respondent, the state of North Dakota. Your honors, this court has long held that canine sniffs do not independently constitute a Fourth Amendment search. Today, I will demonstrate that given Officer Vinson and canine Earl's constitutionally lawful presence in the common hallway, their additional execution of a canine sniff there did not violate Mr. Wynn's Fourth Amendment rights. But even if this court should find that canine sniffs of apartment hallways are a search, we submit that this sniff test still comports with the Fourth Amendment because at most reasonable suspicion, not probable cause, should govern its constitutionality. So in what cases have we allowed searches of homes on the basis only of reasonable suspicion? 
Your Honor. When, the, when there are no exigent circumstances, um, et cetera. Uh, I know your concern, Madam Chief Justice, but just because this court has never applied reasonable suspicion so to the home. You concede that we have, in fact, never done so, that you, this is not Terry. This is not Terry, Your Honor, but this court has lowered the probable cause and warrant inquiry in a similar type of search, for example, in area warrant searches of the home. So it's not inconceivable that we could lower the standard of probable cause. But this what is policy reason can you give me for us to reduce probable cause for searches of the home actually chuck it out the window and allow the police anytime they can come up with an articulable suspicion uh, to just barge into a home and search it. Your Honors, it's precisely for the reason that the police in this instance would not be physically invading and barging into a home. Oh, but they would, according to your um, theory. They, you, you think if you can search homes based on reasonable suspicion, <coughs> I don't know where you draw the line between the dog sniffing right at the doorway and just walking on in. Your Honors, we would draw a very firm line and say that canine sniffs of apartment hallways would be what the standard should govern if you were to reject the privacy and property analyses today. And the core of the Fourth Amendment really asks us to perform a balancing inquiry to weigh the government's need to search against the degree of privacy intrusions on the individual. And here we have a very minimally intrusive search technique. The canine is not entering the home. The canine is not touching even the front door. And the canine is not ascertaining any constitutionally protected detail of the home. Well, so why is this different than Hardinas? Your Honors, this is different because in the case of Hardinez, the police officer and the canine officer trespassed onto the respondent's curtilage. Here we but do- the, this was a trespass too. The state court told us that. That's correct, Your Honor. But in this instance, the police officers did not trespass onto curtilage. They did not con uh, commit a property-based constitutional violation. That's a circular argument though. The, the state court told us they did trespass and that means uh, that they are right there by the the apartment door. Uh, I don't see why, um, if they've trespassed, why the dog gets to be there sniffing. Your Honors, this court held in United States versus Oliver and in Dunn that uh, trespasses, technical trespasses or criminal trespasses are not encompassed wholly by the Fourth Amendment. There are instances, for example, in open fields where the police are committing a criminal trespass but are nevertheless not infringing the Fourth Amendment. That's true, but it really seems to me that you're asking us to completely take leave of reality to equate hallways inside an apartment building that are protected by lock and key with an open field uh, in which we've said, you know, when you've got an open field full of marijuana plants or something, um, of course, there's a, a different calculus of, of reasonable expectations of privacy and the like, but we have something quite different. So yes, Your Honor, while we would certainly admit that this hallway carries a higher privacy interest than a cornfield 60 acres wide, it nevertheless does not carry an expectation of privacy that's constitutionally salient enough to trigger the Fourth Amendment. So the, the realities of apartment living dictate that Mr. Wynn lives in a hallway where his co-tenants could invite any member of the public, including the police, into the hallway. But the Fourth Amendment just doesn't protect people without the economic wherewithal to have a standalone home, is that it? Your Honor, we do not believe that the Fourth Amendment puts a thumb on the scale in favor of people who live in standalone homes. Rather, the- It does, it, because they're, they're under Hardinas, whereas people who live in apartments are under your rule. Your Honors, we believe that the Fourth Amendment is descriptive and not normative. It's inevitable that people with larger houses have a larger area of protection than people with smaller houses. And similarly, even in the context of standalone homes, those who live abutting a public street have a lower expectation of privacy than those living in a 60-acre farm. But that is the reality of modern living, and that, uh, that is the reality of Fourth Amendment protections insofar as it is descriptive and not normative. But, Your Honors, in this instance, the canine sniff itself does not constitute a search for two reasons. And the first is that this court plainly held in United States versus Place and Illinois versus Cabalas that canine sniffs are so minimally intrusive that they are sui generis. And the second. So, so, what's important about the dogs? Uh, is it that the sniffing is just the dog's nose by the side of the door, and that isn't really terribly, although it could certainly be a, a sound detection device or a heat detection device or any other sort of device, and we might have concerns, as Kylo says. Or is it that you think that the science is something that leads to this binary idea, that there's either something bad going on or not? Because there's actually a lot of new science to suggest 
that that's not true. And it seems foolish for us to adopt a rule of law that relies on out-of-date science. So, Your Honor, this dog sniff is binary with respect to the information that it's communicating to the officer. But there's your opponents say that it isn't. Your opponents say that some kind of insecticides have the same volatiles, have some, you know, that there are other cleaning products that may be perfectly legal that also have the same volatiles and that there are going to be, in short, way too many false positives with just the intrusive effect we worried about in Kylo. So there's two responses to this, Your Honor. The first is that this court already dealt with this issue in United States versus Jacobson, where a DEA agent performed a chemical test on a powder. At the time, they didn't realize the powder was cocaine, so they tested it for a profile of compounds that are present in cocaine. And despite the fact that many of these compounds in the powder are present in lawful substances, the court held that because this test only communicated either that the powder was or was not cocaine, that this sort of test is binary. And here we have a dog sniff that's sufficiently analogous. When the dog is sitting down, he's indicating the presence of contraband. So what if when the dog sat down, I mean, I, this is a counterfactual, what if they go into the apartment and they discover a big vat of insecticide because it turns out that Mr. Wynn, you know, was working as a gardener and he was going to go treat somebody's house? In that instance, Your Honor, the dog would have committed a false alert. Correct. That's so the problem. That is correct, Your Honor. So in this instance, the court should look to Florida v. Harris, where it said that a dog sniff is presumptively sufficient for probable cause unless the defendant can mount evidence to show that the dog is inaccurate. But here we do not have an accuracy concern across the board for dog sniffs. This court has consistently recognized that dog sniffs are sufficient for probable cause. And with respect to Earl, the record establishes that Earl is a good dog. He's had... <laughs> we, we like Earl. You know, we have nothing against Earl here. But, but what is... What is a concern, though, is, is, as we were discussing with your opponents, the intersection between the Kabbalah's rule and the Kylo rule, and using the dog sniff uh, as support for the warrant actually to get into the home. So in this instance, Your Honor, we do not believe that the Kabbalah's line of precedent and the Kylo line of precedent are irreconcilable. And the reason is because counsel for petitioner really reads Kylo too broadly for two reasons. The first is that the actual language of Kylo cabins the holding of Kylo. Kylo doesn't stand for the proposition that all details of the home are intimate, rather that lawful details of the home are intimate. So in the instance of Kylo, a thermal imaging device is able to reveal the relative temperatures of the walls. And whereas this may be a very mundane detail, it is nevertheless a lawful detail. A dog, on the other hand, cannot reveal any lawful detail of the home. When it indicates, it's purely indicating that there's a presence of illegal contraband inside the home. Well, or as you just said, perhaps the, president, the presence of a substance that sometimes might indicate illegal contraband, but sometimes might not. That's correct, Your Honor. But again, that goes to the uh, probable cause analysis. And if dogs, if you were concerned about the accuracy of dog sniffs, this court could choose to overturn Florida v. Harris and re-examine whether dog sniffs are sufficient independently to establish probable cause. But that's not at issue today. As I understand your argument, though, um, if we're to um, to go down this path and permit uh, dog sniffs based on reasonable suspicion, um, I think we have to reconsider Kylo and decide whether reasonable suspicion would justify thermal in imaging. It's really about the methodology, isn't it? Not about the place where the search takes place. Uh, that's correct, Your Honor. Um, this w uh, for a reasonable suspicion balancing test, you would have to look at the methodology. But we believe that we need not even reach the question of reasonable suspicion today because a dog sniff is so binary and so minimally intrusive that it's not a Fourth Amendment search. This court only need decide whether or not a standard of reasonable suspicion should be applied if it rejects the fact that a dog sniff is not a search. So in this instance, a dog sniff is not a search because it is purely binary and it's executed. But how is that reconcilable with Hardina's? I mean, it has to be a search, right? Your Honors, in Hardina's, the court found that the dog sniff was a search, not because of the actual uh, privacy intrusion of the dog, but rather that the officer and the dog were committing a constitutional trespass. So this case is- So just without the dog, I mean, <laughs> it, it has to be about the dog. I mean, the officer could go up to the door in Hardina's, and that wouldn't have been a search if they just stood there, right? Your Honors, if the, the officer- The officer could go up to the door and knock on it, as right. they do all the time with their knock and- 
talk. So it's the dog that made it a search. <laughs> Your honors, we respectfully disagree that it's the dog. Of course, an officer is allowed to perform a knock and talk, but if the officer in Hardinas without a dog were to, you know, cut down Mr. Hardinas's bushes and start looking for marijuana buried under in his mulch, that would similarly be a search. What, what the court had a problem with is that the officers were conducting an investigation in Mr. Hardinas's cartilage. Here, we do not have a similar concern. The hallway is, is a public thoroughfare where members of the public can come and go. It's not yeah, Mr. Hardinas's thoroughfare. It's locked. <laughs> it's not a public thoroughfare, whatever it may be. Whether it's enough, this is a question, uh, that some people can come and other people can't, and it's not entirely under Mr. Wynn's control, that's one thing. It's certainly not a public thoroughfare. The sidewalk outside the building is a public thoroughfare. Uh, and your theory is that shared interest is never enough. So uh, that's something, too, that we need to uh, consider. Uh, but but, but I'm, I'm with the idea that the, to, to say the dog isn't an important part of the Hardinas case is pretty wild. Your Honors, the dog was certainly the, the tool that the officers used in Hardinas to conduct their investigation. But in this instance, we have a case that's patently distinguishable from, from Hardinas because we do not have the police officers and the canine officer in an area that is Mr. Wynn's cartilage. So they could have used a thermal imaging device at the door of Mr. Wynn's apartment, too? Uh, no, Your Honor. So the third imaging device was found to violate the Fourth Amendment because it revealed a lawful detail of the home. So if in this instance, the police officers were to use such a device, they would have committed a Fourth Amendment search. What's really different in the- It didn't necessarily reveal a lawful detail. It's just that the court was concerned it could. There would be too much potentially lawful information coming along with the unlawful. They had actually done quite a bit of background work in Kylo looking at the electric bills, looking at everything. I'm not sure this was such a pristine operation. Uh, Your Honors, in the case of Kylo, whereas the relative temperatures of the wall seems very mundane and maybe not a salient detail of the home that Kylo himself hoped to keep private, it's nevertheless still a detail that's distinguishable from contraband, which contains no privacy interest under this court's jurisprudence. But you've agreed that there could be other things with the same volatile compounds that the dogs might alert to that are not contraband. That's correct, Your Honor. But in this instance, I think the key distinction is that canine dogs are not trained to alert specifically to methobenzoate or acetic acid. But if they were, this would be a different case. I mean, you could probably train a dog to alert to um, some sort of medication or something else that is legal, right? Yes, Your Honor. So in this instance, the dog is trained not to alert to one single compound, but a whole profile of compounds. And while methobenzoate or acetic acid is a very strong odor that the dog can recognize, when the dog is detecting an odors, it's detecting an entire profile. When it's alerting, it's alerting to the contraband. And when it's smelling acetic acid, for example, in vinegar and alerting, then it's falsely alerting. So we do not have that concern here. Moreover, perhaps it would make Your Honors feel more comfortable that in this case, the contraband at issue is marijuana, and marijuana has no smell like analog. So when the dog is alerting to marijuana, it's truly alerting to marijuana. Moreover, Your Honors, the Council for Petitioner has raised the issue of CARO to stand for the proposition that perhaps the home contains some privacy interest external to the contents itself. But CARO can also be plainly distinguished from this case because in CARO, the beeper actually revealed the presence of a lawful item within the home, which is ether, and it also revealed the physical location of the home itself. So in CARO, we have details that are being relayed to police officers that we are not here. What's really dispositive today, Your Honors, is that canine sniffs are such a minimally intrusive and binary technique that they practically have no analog in law enforcement. So when you really look at the privacy interest that's being compromised in this instance, you see that there is no legitimate privacy interest in contraband and that Mr. Wynn's expectations that his marijuana will remain hidden is not something that this court or that society should sanction. So therefore, Your Honors, today Mr. Wynn has not had his property or privacy-based interests under the Fourth Amendment violated, and therefore the police officers did not commit a search when they walked into a common hallway to detect a marijuana that they had a verified tip for. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Jan, do you reserve some rebuttal time? Thank you. And I have three issues I would like to touch on in rebuttal. 
So to begin with the issue of whether you need to have a right, a unilateral right to excludability in order to claim Fourth Amendment protection, I think it's imp important to first note that Mr. Wynn does have a right of excludability in this case with respect to members of the general public. And that's how the officers grouped themselves when they chose to enter the building without getting permission from any tenant. And so Mr. Wynn would have had the right to exclude them if he had been in the hallway at the time. But second, this court held in McDonald that an individual- How would he have known though? I mean, how, how would that have looked? What would he have done? I think he would have asked the officers, did someone let you in? They were plainclothes officers. It wasn't obvious they were police officers. Um, and if they had said, no, we don't have a license to be in here, um, or weren't able to give a legitimate purpose for their presence, he could have asked them to leave. What if they had said one of the residents asked us to look into something, which is true? So in that case, um, if he felt like they did have a license to be there, he might have been able to call the police, and you can't call the police to get the police out. But the fact that the police can trespass and other police can't come and remove them from the area doesn't mean that there's no Fourth Amendment protection there. Could, he, case, could he view self-help to eject them? No, Your Honor. Um, he could not have, we don't think, uh, physically removed them from the space. Um, because, again, there is going to be some sort of uh, issue with whether he knows that they are there unlawfully. So that would not be an advisable And they had an 80-pound dog with them. Yes. Um, <laughs> so we would not advise our client to do that in the future. <laughs> but more importantly, this court held in McDonald in a boarding house case that every tenant in the house had a collective interest in the integrity and security of the entire building, even though none of them had a unilateral right to exclude anyone from the common areas of that space. And that's exactly the case here. There's a collective right to exclude people from the building, a collective interest in the integrity of the building, and that's the interest that Mr. Wynn bases his Fourth Amendment claim on. But finally, this court held in Randolph that we're not looking just to the niceties of property law, but rather also to social expectations. And so at the absolute least, Mr. Wynn would have a socially recognized right of excludability to the doormat area right in front of his door. If someone were loitering in that area and hanging out there, he could absolutely say to them that they have to leave, even if they had a license to be in the building, even if they were a co-tenant. And though he might not have a property law basis to enforce that right, he would certainly have the social expectation that that person would leave and not loiter right in front of his door. So the absolute least, his curtilage should be that area that he can exclude all other individuals from. But then, moving on to the issue of reasonable suspicion, it's important to note at the outset, as you, Madam Chief Justice, noted, this court has never held that reasonable suspicion is sufficient to justify the initial intrusion into a home. And that's exactly what respondents ask you to do here. They put forward a balancing test, but the balancing test they put forward has never been used by this court unless there's a, a substantial non-investigatory purpose. It's actually a test of one. They're saying only dog, sm only dog sniffs would, would, uh, would, would uh, survive. So I think their reasonable suspicion test, Your Honor, is saying that we have to balance the government interest against the personal interest at stake. Um, and that test has been used by this court, but only when there's a substantial non-investigatory purpose for the search. And so that's the test used, for example, in Terry. And so when the government can point to specific exigencies and say there's a specific public safety concern that we have that requires us to detain this individual briefly, then that's when this court would balance the intrusiveness of the stop versus um, the public interest at stake. But it's never been used in this context when this purpose of the stop is purely investigatory. Isn't but, there a public interest in making apartments safe for everyone in them, though? There's certainly an interest in generalized crime control, but this court held in uh, City of Indianapolis v. Edmond, which was a case about checkpoints. The court said, um, and the, the sorry, the city was actually putting up checkpoints and using dog sniffs of the checkpoints, and they tried to justify it in using almost exactly that rationale. They said there's a general public safety interest in stopping drug smuggling, and this court said that that sort of generalized interest isn't sufficient under the Fourth Amendment to constitute the specific public safety exigency that Terry's concerned about, and so that's exactly the same here. But then finally, it's important to recognize what their rule allows in the real world. And what the rule allows is what the Fargo Police Department did in this context. And what they do is every time they get a tip from an anonymous informant, from an officer on patrol, from someone calling in about the potential odor of marijuana in a building or other drug activity, they put the building on a running naughty list that they keep. They don't even need to have a tip, apparently. They don't, apparently. Although I think under the reasonable suspicion rule, if this court went in that direction, they would need to have some tip or something. Um, but so then they keep a running naughty list. Every time there's a slow day in Fargo, they take the police dog out and they run it through six, eight, ten apartment buildings at a time, just looking for evidence of drug. But, but we, we don't we don't look at motive, do we? we? It's an objective test. We you know we don't we don't care. Um, it's it, what would a reasonable police officer do? Is there a reasonable expectation of privacy? We don't we don't care what their motives do, are, do we? Sure, Your Honor, but if this court goes in the reasonable suspicion direction, understanding the real world implications and how intrusive it would be is critical to properly applying the balancing test that they want you to adopt. So even if the court goes and adopts that balancing test, there's still a substantial intrusive effect that would be possible in there. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Thanks to all counsel. This court will take the case under advisement and we will recess briefly. Please be seated. <laughs> the master of ceremonies. Yes, we don't want to begin too quickly. Um, well, we are ready to announce uh, the winners, but we collectively want to preface our announcements with our gratefulness and our praise for all four of you for this entire program for everyone who had anything to do with putting this very fascinating case together it was a pleasure for for all of us uh, and uh, I, I only wish that we could just leave it at that and give everybody an award but but we are charged with announcing best brief best oral advocate and best overall team so we're now ready to do that in that order. So we have decided that the best brief is the brief of petitioners Allison Gaki and Sean Janda. <laughs> and our award for best oral advocate goes to Andrew Chang. And finally, um, and I, I just stress again, this was a tough call, but um, which is to say praise to everyone, but the best overall team is the petitioners. <laughs> and now I think each one of us has a word or two, so. Judge Friedman, if you'd like to start. Uh, sure. So I really just want to emphasize over the, more, more than anything else that you all were fantastic. I would be so happy to receive these <laughs> briefs. I wish all of my briefs were like these briefs. Um, they, yeah, they're not all. And, and these were fantastic briefs and fantastic arguments and uh, really m way beyond the average quality of what I see in normal sittings, um, much better all around. So I, I do regret that we had to make choices because you all deserve awards for this performance. Um, I, um, so to give a little more detail, for both of you, um, we found it admirable that you took a strong position and stuck with it. Um, I, I actually do think it's hard to figure out where there's a logical line that you could have drawn short of that. Um, and you were bold about just going for it <laughs> and not, not trying to hold back on the extreme position and then just defending it and staying calm when all of us looked a little skeptical. So I thought that was excellent. Um, and um, you both also did an excellent job of actually responding to our questions, actually staying calm. You know, we, we tried to take you off. Uh, you also both, I think, covered each other's arguments very well. The, the issues are overlapping, and I think you were very prepared to deal with each other's issues um, and not to say that's my co-counsel's issue. Um, so that was very well done, and um, we really were able to engage in the dialogue that, um, that we all want to have an argument. So it was excellent. Um, I agree. It really is a pleasure to... Um, here are the presentations, and you're welcome to the Tenth Circuit in a couple years to come argue some cases. Um, I, I agree with what uh, Judge Friedland said. I um, I thought that um, you know uh, this team had some hard arguments, Mr. Janda. You had a, a, a you know some uh, tough sledding to do, and you really um, did a terrific job. And um, uh, one of the things I always liked to do when I was in private practice was the rebuttal. I was frequently a petitioner because. I got hired in lost causes, and um, but I always, I always save 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 room for rebuttal, and I thought you did a, a very nice job in summing up the argument. I think um, 
um, you, you should be um, happy about the way that you did. But um, certainly the, the, the way that you understood the precedent, the key precedent, was, um, was very, very strong. I think all four of you um, really were stellar in, in that regard. And um, I like the way you threw in some um, effective policy arguments in the, um, in the briefs also, you know, effective at a Supreme Court justice. So um, r really nice job. Yes, and I, I second everything that's, that's been said. I thought all four of you really did a terrific job using the, the cases that are out there, understanding which ones uh, supported you, understanding the limitations of, of those holdings. Uh, there are, in fact, strong uh, arguments on both sides of this problem. I think it was a superb problem, and I'm glad I don't have to decide it, to be honest, <laughs> because I have no idea, as I sit here right now, uh, which side I would rule for. I thought it was, it was very balanced in that sense, and there are different threads of Supreme Court law that would take you in the petitioner's direction if you go you know, the home is sacred root, and if you think of the formalities of property law, but on the other hand, this is searches. The court has been um, very cognizant of, of the needs of police officers and of the limitations uh, that either should or should not be put on them. So I, I really thought you used the law very well. Uh, I'll add uh, my 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 own thought that I was delighted that nobody said that's not my problem to talk about it's somebody <laughs> else's. This is not, I mean, it's not usual in oral arguments that people will break up a case, but it does happen. Sometimes in a complex criminal appeal, you'll have a couple of different lawyers and one will take, you know, an argument about the indictment and somebody else will take an evidentiary argument, but you have to be ready to answer whatever random question the court has, even if you think it's a silly question. And you all had a nice, respectful demeanor, uh, and I think really handled yourselves beautifully. So it was a pleasure uh, to participate. You all did wonderfully, and we thank you for inviting us to come.